Hello. Welcome to a very special mini myth. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I thought about trying to sing that in a spookier way, but I can't sing at all, so it seems like an awful idea. <laughs> Stick with what you know, which is this one tune. Happy Friday the 13th, my friends. And a Friday the 13th in October, no less. Could it be any creepier? Now that I've gotten my Chandler impression out of the way, I want to tell you what we have coming up in this spooky month that is October. Now, I love October. I love Halloween. I love everything spooky and scary except haunted houses because fuck that shit. I don't want anyone jumping out at me ever. For the first time since this podcast started, I've actually made a plan for upcoming episodes. And that is specifically because I wanted to fit them into an October theme. Organization is something I do only when I have a really good reason. So, today I have a very special mini-myth, but details on that to come. In the coming weeks, we'll have episodes in mini-myths complete with murder, abandonment, trips to the underworld, monsters, 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 and let's not forget... Lots and lots of magic. Now, with that out of the way, let's delve right in. Mini Myth Tantalus's Tantalizing Test. It starts in the city of Mycenae one of the most ancient cities of Greek history and mythology, home to Agamemnon and his house of horrors. But timely as it may seem, we're not delving into Agamemnon's house quite yet. No, he's part of a much larger story still to come. It will need episodes upon episodes upon episodes, so not quite going there yet. But for now... How did Agamemnon's House of Horrors come to be? Well, it all started with a curse. One of Zeus's many, many, many children was a man by the name of Tantalus. Tantalus was Zeus's son, but also king of Mount Sipolis in Lydia. Lydia was the ancient region of Turkey. Tantalus was king of Mount Sipolis, and he was a friend of the gods. Quite familiar, actually, which was not exactly common for normal people on Earth, even when their father was Zeus. He had so many kids, I'm not sure he gave a good goddamn about most of them, but Tantalus was different. He hung out with the gods quite often, he hosted them, he could talk to them about his problems, they were really tight. But Tantalus became so comfortable so familiar with the gods that he started to question just how powerful they really were. They became real to him, which led him to believe that it might be a good idea to test them. I think you could probably tell this would not be the greatest plan, but, you know, you're practiced now. Listening to me has its perks, my friends. You will never get caught up with Zeus. And if you do, it's all your damn fault because, my god, I've taught you better. But sure, maybe you could foresee that you shouldn't test the gods. But I don't know that anyone would think to do what he does. At least I hope. If you do, I think you need to go away. But we're not there yet. No, Tantalus starts small. First, he steals some ambrosia from the gods, and he distributes it to some mortals. Now, ambrosia isn't any old thing. Just last week we learned that Psyche drank it to become immortal. This is powerful shit. Ambrosia is a powerful thing, and it is meant only for the gods. They like their power exclusive. It's their thing. But Tantalus' real test of the gods was not ambrosia. His real test for what powers they did or did not have came when he invited them all to dinner. All the Olympians were invited, and Tantalus hosted them at his palace for a special dinner. Tantalus served them a dish, a Tantalus original, you might say, something he made 
exactly for the gods, made just right, just to suit their needs. They sit down to dinner and they examine what's just been presented in front of them. For the most part, they're unsure, they don't touch it. Except Demeter, see, this is the time of year when Persephone was spending her time with Hades in the underworld, and so Demeter was distracted. Without paying attention, she ate a bite of the meal, not noticing that all her godly pals hadn't touched their own. They were all in shock, see. They were staring at their plates in horror. This was not a stew. Certainly not any stew that should be eaten by the gods. Tantalus, who, frankly, was a sick fuck, had killed his own son, Pelops, and cut him up into little pieces and cooked him up real nice in a rich sauce. Tasty. Now, it seems odd to have to clarify, but the gods did so much fucked up shit. But the shit that was too fucked up, even for the gods, was cannibalism and infanticide, filicide, whatever you want to call the act of killing your children. In this case, killing your children and eating them, and all to make a point that really doesn't seem worth making. Like, you killed your kid and cooked him and served him to the gods to, what, prove the gods did have powers? It seems a bit over the top to me, but I mean, what do I know? I don't have kids. Now, this may sound tragic, in addition to gross and insane, but actually this turned into a rare moment when the gods were helpful and nice even if it was in response to something super weird and tragic and generally just gross. The gods banded together around this murderous dinner table, and they put Pelops together again, piece by piece. The only piece of Pelops that would never again be whole was the little bite that Demeter took before she realized. It was a little piece of Pelops' shoulder, and the god Hephaestus would make him an ivory shoulder to put in place, which... I assume was otherwise just a weird gaping hole in the middle of his shoulder. I'm picturing like a cartoon, like it's not bloody or anything, there's just a hole. Like a big bite mark out of it, you know? And for Tantalus' punishment, Tantalus was sent down to Hades. But not just to the underworld. No, Tantalus is one of the rare few that was sent to live forever in Tartarus. The darkest depths of the underworld for the worst and most awful among us. I think Ted Bundy's there too. They play cards sometimes. In Tartarus, Tantalus is forced to spend every moment seeking food and water that he'll never have. Tantalus stands in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree with low-hanging branches. Low-hanging fruit, you might even say. But whenever he raises an arm to grab a piece of fruit from the tree, the branches pull just out of his grasp. And whenever he bends down to get a drink, the water recedes just so far as to make it so that he will never get a sip. And that, my friends, is the origin of the English word tantalize, and one of the worst stories of murder and cannibalism in Greek mythology. Just one of them, though. There are more. Don't fret. Well, that's our first stop on the road that is October. And yes, that's an awful metaphor. But what do you want from me? I just wrote the whole damn thing and I can only be so clever and creative until it all runs out and need more wine. <sighs> Thank you ever so much for listening. I'll be back next week with a man whose wife is arguably more famous than him, even if she is utterly batshit fucking crazy. I'm Liv. And if it's not already very, very obvious, I fucking love this shit. 